Welcome to Good Game, the show for gamers by gamers. I'm Hex. And I'm Barjo. This week on the show, we have a sequel, an expansion, and a reboot. That's right, Perfect Dark. It was an absolute classic for the Nintendo 64 and for FPS console gaming. It's been given a facelift for XBLA, and we'll see if it stood the test of time. And one of our favourite games from last year, Dragon Age Origins, gets its first expansion, and it's called Awakening. Plus, Ajax in his first story visits one man and his shed. A shed that happens to hold gazillions of dollars worth of gaming gear. Oh, we're in a spin. We're going down, we're going down. But first, can you guess the game for this week? Oh my god, that one's so easy. Go read the news. Oh, no wheels. <laughs> Good news for the troubled British video game industry. The Chancellor of the Exchequer has pledged to introduce tax breaks for developers, similar to the benefits enjoyed by the British film industry. The news should come as a relief to UK devs. The British games industry used to be number three in the world after Japan and the US, but recently lost that position to Canada. In related news, Warner Brothers has announced that it's opening a new games development studio in Montreal. Tax incentives from the Quebec government have made the city a global gaming hub, with Electronic Arts and Ubisoft also operating major studios there. Sad news, gaming fans. Robert Culp recently passed away. The 79-year-old actor was famous for his role as the evil Dr. Breen in Half-Life 2, but he also led a distinguished career in film and TV, starring in such memorable shows as The Greatest American Hero and the original I Spy series from the 60s. We might have been able to work together in an atmosphere of mutual trust and respect. A voice actor of the highest calibre, Mr. Culp will be sorely missed. Animation fans will be pleased to learn that Australian artist Paul Robertson is working on the official video game adaptation of the popular Scott Pilgrim graphic novels. In addition to animating character sprites in such iconic games as Drawn to Life, the next chapter, Mr. Robertson has achieved cult superstardom with his game-inspired music videos. The Scott Pilgrim graphic novels are also being adapted into a major motion picture, directed by Edgar Wright. Good game! Perfect Dark. It's considered by many as one of the greatest Nintendo 64 games of all time, so there's some high expectations with this XBLA re-release, but I think they've done a near-perfect job. All we have is the name. Good luck, Perfect Dark. For the uninitiated, Perfect Dark is set in the year 2023, with you playing as Joanna Dark, a special agent of the Carrington Institute. You progress through an intricate sci-fi tale of shady corporate conspiracies and intergalactic warfare, using some of gaming's most memorable gadgets and weapons. Now, I actually missed out on this back in the day, but from what I understand, the reason it was so highly regarded was because at its time it was the pinnacle of FPS on a console. Yeah, I mean, it's not really until Halo came out years later that any game could claim to have taken its console shooting crown. There's someone here! But we've come a long way in the 10 years since then, and console shooters are definitely closing the gap between them and their PC brethren. Just take one look at Battlefield Bad Company 2 and you can see how far they've come. Plus, it's certainly a trip down memory lane to a time when game design was much harsher. You know, there's no checkpoints in this. You have to start all the way back from the beginning of the level, and there's no regening health or compass to point you in the right direction. Not to mention the wonky control. Yeah, but that one stick was revolutionary for its time, which brings me to what is probably the only real change to the gameplay, dual stick control. Now, this may upset some of the purists out there, but I don't know, I like dual sticks. It just feels great to be able to strafe and shoot properly. Dual stick or no hex, aiming just feels wonky, and without that epic auto aim, that's on by default, you're gonna have trouble hitting anything. Also, I don't like the actual aiming mode, it's just you're playing this whole sick little game of fight the auto center, and stupid crosshair, do what I want, and there's no jump button. Yeah, but that, that's just how it was, and I found it a refreshing way to play a shooter. You know, with that auto aim, it's almost like you could aim with the power of thought. It's just a different style of play. That doesn't mean I have to like it. You're given three control setups to choose from, Classic, Spartan and Duty Calls, all of which are pretty much the same, just with different button layouts. And I'll leave it to you to guess which games they're based off. Yeah. Mm. Graphically speaking, it's still an N64 game. The textures have had a nice upgrade and it runs at 60 frames per second, but all the animations are pretty much left untouched, so it gives it a distinct 64 feel. You know, the stupid AI and dodgy animations just bring back so many great memories. It's hard not to grin when you see that old do a roll, get shot, stand up and then die animation. Oh, and the music.
music, I forgot how awesome it was. And it's even more awesome now because of its cheesy retroness. Okay, Hex, don't fangirl out on me now. Yeah, okay. Still, the only real upgrade here is the online multiplayer, and I don't know, I was a bit disappointed by the matchmaking. Yeah, you can have up to eight players in a game, but out of all the games we joined, it only ever found one or two players and then just started the match. Not to mention half of them were so laggy, it was like playing on 56k. <sighs> Yeah, and if you do want to take this online, you really do need to have a few local friends you can set up matches with, as the matchmaking isn't great. And although it's nice to have a screen all to yourself, it's still just as much fun as ever to have three friends come over and, and enjoy some sports between mayhem. They've included leaderboards now, which rate you on speed and points, and it's nice to see how you stack up against your friends and other people around the world. On a slight tangent though, you know, with that GoldenEye remake looking like it's never going to see the light of day, this is as close as we're going to get to some online GoldenEye action. A selection of classic GoldenEye maps and weapons are here, just like in the original Perfect Dark. Yeah, it isn't GoldenEye and I want GoldenEye, but this is a damn fine substitute. And on that note, we should probably wrap things up. Final thoughts? Clearly I can see how awesome this was for its day and how much influence it's had, but coming at it from a modern perspective, without having that nostalgic trip to take joy in, I just couldn't get much from this game. So I'm giving it six out of 10 rubber chickens. Bajo, to me, it's a total love letter to the fans. They're faithful to the original in all the right ways, while still including the features you'd expect from a modern re-release. I have to disagree with you. It's an easy nine out of 10 from me. To get the most out of your favourite games, it pays to put the extra effort into your gaming setup. For example, when I play racing games, I like to go the extra mile. So with a bit of gaffer tape and old timber, I've been able to transform my gaming setup into this Formula One racing car. Look, it does its job. But for something a bit more impressive, check this out. I'm Matthew Scheel, and this is my 747 simulator. So, Matt, tell us a little bit about what we're sitting in now. We're sitting in a Boeing 747-400 series, which is the newer of the 747s. It weighs about two and a half tonne. It's been constructed over ten years. I've always been interested in the aircraft. From the time I was a kid, I used to build cardboard simulators. And then when I got the means to actually do something myself, well, I just got a little bit carried away, I guess you might say. So from go to woe, how long did it take to make? I guess there was probably a good five years of construction that went into it. Uh, we've only recently put on a new visual system, which is 180 degrees. It's about a uh, eight metre screen by two metre screen run with three projectors that gives you the sensation that you're moving, even if you're not moving. About four years ago, we put hydraulic motion on and that makes the simulator move around when you're on board. What was the most difficult thing to get right? A lot of the things that you don't see, for example, the rudder pedals that you put your feet on, took a long time to construct and have them operate because they do adjust forward and back. I must admit, it quite amazes me how it keeps going most of the time because with 40 programs and 14 computers all trying to talk to each other, it just blows me away how it doesn't break down a lot more often. So I've been waiting to ask, can I take the controls? Sure you can. Where you go. You're all flying right. now. All right. So you're also an accredited pilot. How does flying this compare to flying a real plane? Well, no comparison at all. You're very regimented when you fly. You can't go away from the track that you've been assigned. Whereas in a simulator, you can do whatever you like. If we want to go inverted and fly upside down, we can do that because we're not doing any harm. So how do you top this toy? What are you going to build next? There's an old saying, he who dies with the most toys wins. I think I've just about got it. It's literally a toy. It's a big Nintendo game. We enjoy it. I have friends come out and everyone is just blown away. They can't believe how real it is when you're inside. All right, let's do it again. We're flying down the ILS of uh, Kai Tak and we'll attempt to land on the runway since you're flying. All right, attempt. Come on, we're going to land. There we go, got the runway visual. 
And that wasn't bad for your first attempt at Kai Tak. Thanks, mate. You made it to the run. <laughs> it was all right. Time for a gin and tonic. Yeah. Good game. Over the last year or so, we've been asking all the developers we've met what game they're most looking forward to, and one game keeps getting mentioned. For me personally, and I think for I speak for a lot of the Xbox team members, it's definitely Pipe Buster 2. I think it'd have to be either Diablo 3 or Pipe Buster 2. We believe that, you know, Natal is just going to really open up new doors, new ways for people to think about playing Pipe Buster. Well, it's here. Pipe Buster number two. The concept is essentially the same as the first game. Player one is in charge of building and maintaining a network of pipes that deliver the population's waste products safely to the sewage farm. Player two attempts to create a Pipe Buster, a stool so massive that it ruptures the pipes, causing large-scale destruction. But this time, it all happens in space. That's right, as player one, you're now in charge of maintaining an entire sewage system on the USS Turtolot, from the hundreds of toilets to the recycling plant at the centre of the starship. And as player two, you now have control over the whole crew, attempting to snap off that pipe buster. A main complaint with the first game was that it was just too easy, and they've definitely ramped up the difficulty here. Water is now a finite resource and has to be recycled to keep things moving, and the ship's pipe system is way more complicated to maintain. Yeah, I thought I was doing a great job of keeping everything flushing along, and then Hex let go one of her giant alien jobbies, and suddenly my galley and bridge were knee-deep in floaters. Yes, the aliens. Man, those guys can eat. But if you combo up their intake, you have the opportunity to release a potential game winner. It's a risky all-or-nothing strat, though, as you'll struggle to find enough food for your regular crew to let go anything more than a few nuggets. Plus, it also lets the other player know what you're doing when all they see coming down the pipes are a few rabbit droppings. Pipe Buster Number 2's is the first game to use both Microsoft's Project Natal and the PlayStation Move. What did you think? Yeah, to be honest, I don't know. It felt a bit odd. Y yeah, there was a definite lag between what I was doing and then seeing it on the screen. Oh, there's definitely lag there, isn't there? It's so unresponsive. It all felt a bit tacked on, didn't it? It didn't really add much to the gameplay. Final thoughts? I just felt like I was going through the motions. The original Pipe Buster was one of my all-time favourite games, but I'm a bit ambivalent about my time playing with number twos. I think they could have and should have done more interesting things with the space setting. And, you know, I've created things more interesting than what these aliens plopped out. But it does give good unlock. The anti-gravity gun, which turns all effluent into globule splatter, is particularly satisfying. It's not a stinker, but it's not quite the satisfying release I was hoping for. So I'm giving it 6 out of 10 rubber chickens. Massive spoiler alert now. It really is worth pushing hard to get all the unlocks to access the deluge. Getting 10 of your crew members to simultaneously bomb the basin, it's, it's not easy, but if you can manage it, the subsequent explosion is one of the best moments I've seen in gaming in a long time. I loved it. It's 9 out of 10 from me. <laughs> Good game. We've been getting more and more requests to review games for the iPhone and iPod Touch, so we thought we'd take a look at some of the top games in the App Store to see if the PSP and DS are in any danger of getting shelved just yet. Unfortunately, a top rating game on the App Store doesn't necessarily mean a top quality one. A game might be high on the list simply because it's cheap, and then even more people buy it thinking, well, someone else is buying it, it must be good. Wrong. With that in mind, we picked a few of the more popular games that actually caught our interest, and as well as taking the advice of some of our forum goers. First up, Space Miner, Space or Bust. It's sweet asteroid shooting madness as you navigate your mining ship through asteroid fields to help your crazy uncle Jeb pay off a nasty debt to the bank. You'll also need to locate satellites to download navigation data to unlock new space sectors, which increase in difficulty the further out into space you go. 
You'll be mining space ore that's found within the asteroids you blast to smithereens by pulling it into your ship with a nifty tractor beam. Movement of your ship is controlled with a virtual directional pad on the screen, which is responsive, but maybe not quite precise enough. You're not alone out there in space, though. Pesky androids will try and take you out, as well as taking your precious ore, and generally make life difficult for you by showering you with gunfire while you attempt to complete side missions, like saving tourists or activating a bunch of satellites. You'll use the ore you collect to purchase upgrades for your mining ship, and these range from nuclear reactors for more power, to better engines, to additional guns, shields and scanners. And you really notice a difference once you applied an upgrade. These help to make the space miner feel less like a souped up version of asteroids and more a genuine game in its own right. Yeah, I agree. I mean, you'll find yourself skipping through a lot of the dialogue, though. However, when you do stop to read it, it can actually be quite funny, but it's just there was so much of it that, I mean, I rarely bothered. Just get back to the pew-pew action already. It's a good little game, though, and definitely has that addictive quality of constantly getting those upgrades to beef up your ship, if a little repetitive. I'm giving it seven. Yeah, it's a seven from me, too. And a big thank you to Beathy on our forums, who suggested that game to us. Next up, Ragdoll Blaster 2. This is a puzzle game that will see you shooting ragdolls out of cannons to hit a target while navigating a variety of obstacles. You'll need to use the elements within each level, such as ice, additional cannons, gravity portals, seesaws or air vents to send your ragdoll home. It has a nice look to it and I like the way that all the ragdolls flop about and pile up on the ground as you fire a bunch of them in a row. You tap anywhere on the screen that you want your doll to be fired, closer to the cannon for a, a less powerful shot and further away for a more powerful one. This game is crazy addictive. I love problem solving and I had so many moments of frustration followed by joy as I realised I'd been going about the whole scenario all wrong. You really need to work out the physics of the level and determine how much cannon force to use and which part of the obstacle to tackle first. Oh, and I love the music too. It's great to tune out with headphones when you're on the train. Yeah, it's good puzzle solving fun. I just wish it had a steeper learning curve. I felt like I was ploughing through the early levels way too easy and I just kept waiting for those tricky puzzles to come and they never really did. I just felt it should have been harder early on. The core mechanics are good though. I'm giving it a sample. Really? I don't know. I love this game. I'm having to play it forever. I love tapping my way through while occasionally getting stumped. I predict many a missed stop on the train because of it. I, I love this game. I'm giving it eight and a half. <laughs> Moving on, our final game in the roundup is Crash Bandicoot Nitro Kart 3D. It's kart racing madness and definitely one of the more console-like games we've seen on this platform. Yeah, I mean, I was really impressed with the way it looked, Bajo, not to mention the classic kart racing features it managed to get in there. You can drift, jump, collect item boxes and shoot weapons at other races, all the best elements from Mario Kart, but entertaining nonetheless. The tracks are relatively short, but there's plenty of challenges to navigate and help you keep plugging away. You can unlock other characters by collecting all the letters to spell crash in the cup races. There's also a story mode which will give you a specific objective to achieve in each particular race other than just getting a good placing. Movement in this game though is achieved through tilting the iPhone or iPod left and right. You touch the screen to drift and tap with both thumbs to jump. It's tricky and takes some time to master. I find it really hard to get into a game like this when right away you have to negotiate the lack of control you have over movement. It's kind of like those free-handed racing wheel peripherals for the Wii. You just feel slightly detached from the finer degrees of movement and well, personally I, I like the preciseness of a directional pad and this is a deal breaker for me. Yeah, it's not for everyone but I think once you master it, it actually works okay. Plus you can adjust the sensitivity on the accelerometer to the settings that suit the amount of movement you want to be doing. It's a good looking game and the race has provided a good challenge. I'm giving it 8 out of 10. Yeah, I agree it's a good looking game, but kart racing is something I'd rather do on my home console. You know, there's just so many other games I'd rather be playing on a portable platform and really kart racing without that human multiplayer element is a bit lame. I'm giving it a 6. Well, that brings us to the end of this roundup. If you've got any suggestions for mobile games you'd like us to review, hop in our forums and let us know. Probably be a doctor if I was making games for a living. That's what I trained as, but um, I'm not sure. What I, I'm not sure if I, I probably would be. I don't think I would have changed from my my original goal, but uh, that was the joke. 
it was funny because like I remember when we were interviewing you for the medical school, it was like, where's a doctor? What would I be? Oh, I think professional snowboarder was, my, and they, they thought that was a really unique choice, given that it was in my medical entrance interview. I think they kind of scratched their heads, but that's kind of what I've been like my whole life. Yeah, Evil Doctor's pretty good. I mean, experiments and clones. I mean, we, we tried our hand at the cloning thing, but it just didn't work very well. But, you know, unfortunate. I can give you power and a new life. Good game. Dragon Age gets its first expansion, and it's called Awakening, and it continues the story of the fight against the Blight. If you didn't finish the first game, you can start as an all-new Grey Warden or import your current character over as well as the choices that you made. The best bits about Dragon Age are these choices, so we'll do our best not to spoil anything for you, but we do need to talk about them a bit. This expansion sends your Grey Warden off to Vigil's Keep, where the scattered Darkspawn have been getting organised and pretty soon you meet one that can talk. <gasps> yes, that is your Grey Warden. The mother told it to me that if he was lured to this place and slain, that in time you would come. This Joker face gives you hints at something called the Mother, a giant raving lunatic that even the Darkspawn are afraid of. Mother? It comes with sweet news, I hope. Tell the Mother. As the story progresses, you'll be forced to be the High Justice of the land and make important city decisions, and eventually some pretty momentous ones about what you think are important to protect in this kingdom. I gotta say, Hex, when I imported my fierce rogue Bajo Picard, I felt a little goose bumpy. I'm so attached to my little guy. Yeah, he is pretty ugly, though. He's mad ugly. And, you know, it's something about Bioware games that makes you really love your characters, and I found myself asking throughout this, why do I love this character so much and, and all of his companions? I think it's because you spent 40-plus hours with this character and their friends friends, so it's kind of like seeing an old friend again. I don't think anyone could enjoy this game as much without finishing the original, though. Mm. I mean, they obviously have less time to tell a story here, so the plot develops much quicker, they get straight to the action. Companion missions will now often be sparked by a marking on the world map, such as a tree. Yeah, I didn't like that I couldn't talk to my dudes whenever I wanted, though. I, I liked being able to just spark up a conversation when I was bored, and you can't do that now. Plus, there's so many gifts to give in this game that it's pretty hard to make them not like you. I do not know quite how to thank you. And where's the romance gone? My dwarf has needs. <laughs> and here I was, thinking how I never get hit on by the clientele. Perhaps you'll settle for a drink instead. Now, I know this is an expansion, so it's not quite fair to compare it to the first game, and, and I think the story will probably disappoint fans of the original, but the individual encounters and the writing and voice acting in those bits are very good. The Brute Mothers. They're breeding. I saw an, an army. Some of the side quests, though, did feel like filler. Yeah, your choices always seem to damn you if you do and damn you if you don't, but the fun is having to commit to them anyway and, and not knowing how they're going to turn out. There's plenty of them here, and you have no idea which is the right one. Yeah, they must have had heaps of fun just planning out these little tough decisions. Yeah, it's like they've gone, here's a choice, now how can we make it really hard on the game mode? It's great. We simply have no evidence. He must be released. The gameplay hasn't changed much at all, though, and that's okay, because it was already awesome. I didn't even mind the return of the dancing character glitch, or the odd time where your character's still got a status effect on it during a cutscene. Grey Warden? There are memories within this poor man's mind. They are they're difficult to see. I'm on fire. We can talk about this later. To be specific, there are six new specializations and 56 new spells and abilities. Plus, you can do your own enchantment. Enchantment? Enchantment. It's nice having something extra to craft, and your first town is pretty well stocked with gear, including tier eight and nine gear. Ooh, white steel. What we felt after finishing the first game is that there just wasn't enough gear. I don't think I changed my rogue's weapon until level 17. Here, they fixed that. There's heaps, and it looks great. And there's more regenning mana and stamina and health gear, which I'm a fan of. Everyone has heard of you, and they all know you can kick ass. That's the one who killed the Archdemon. Hold! Bloody hold! a little too much, as we didn't wipe within the first 14 hours of gameplay, so don't be afraid to kick things up to hard. There is more levelling to be done, of course, which brings along new abilities and new specialisations. 
It's worth picking up some respec books from Vigil's Keep. They're only six gold and well worth it. Respecking will let you get rid of all those wasted points. And for the classes we played, we enjoyed most of the new specialization high level spells, even though some of the sustained ability visuals were a little intrusive on the rogue. How could he have changed so much? I think respecking is why it was easier this time around for me, Hex. We just became this uber team, and you can also put points into uh, trees called Clarity and Vitality, which is basically stamina slash mana or constitution. So we were tough, and it was really hard to take us down. With all the new abilities, you'll make some even tougher choices on which path you want to go down the tech tree and which ones you want to map to the radial menus if you're on the console version. And I found I spent way more time setting up all the combat tactics this time around too. I wasn't a huge fan of some of the companions though. Mm. Anders, the apostate mage, was basically just a bitchy Alistair with snowballs. Uh, I didn't do it. And the returning playable character is the last one we would have chosen. <laughs> mm. Not bad. Yeah, and the level design just highlights even more now the need for a jump button. I think when you get to the end of this expansion, you'll feel a bit disappointed. It's like they just threw in a few dragons so they could still call it Dragon Age. But I'm still giving it 8.5 out of 10 rubber chickens because I truly love this game, no matter how hard it tries to let me down. As an expansion, it sits quite well, but the only thing I was left a little bit sad about was that more of the previous story decisions didn't carry over, and I couldn't help but think the work experience kid was the only one left to work on some of the story. I'm giving it seven and a half. She's a tiny thing, but packs a surprising wallop, and in this mood, she'd go straight for my danglers. Good game! So, video game players, did you guess the game for this week? It was Perfect Dark Zero, Rare's prequel to the N64 original, an Xbox 360 exclusive launch title that was originally intended for the Nintendo GameCube. Set three years before the events in the original game, Joanna Dark has yet to be employed by the Carrington Institute and is busy performing bounty hunting duties. It's here in Zero that she perfects her secret agent skills. Next week, we're back with more gaming goodness with a new rugby league game, Rugby League 3. That's the third one. And don't forget, you can catch Good Games Spawn Point on the weekend at 7.25pm on ABC3. And as well as our forums, we also have a Good Game Facebook page creatively titled Good Game. And you can also follow us on Twitter, at Good Game TV. Until next week, gamers, may all your games be good ones. Hex out. Barjo out. I forgot my monkey.